Okay, so now we are continuing where we left off with the first episode. So I'm going to show you what's the catch with compression drivers. If we wind back to first episode, you will see that the compression driver totally destroyed the dome tweeters, even the best dome tweeter in the world. Uh, as far to, as 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 far as distortion goes, it's it's nothing more than a joke in comparison. To be fair, the modern tweeter had a higher frequency extension, so it, it went up beautifully up to 30 kHz. But at the cost of uh, just distorting the crap out of itself and pushed hard. So it means that uh, even though it can go out far, that, that's really good when you listen to it at a quiet volume. But if you are pushing it hard, then getting distortion at 20k plus it's just going to wreak havoc on the sound you are getting out of it uh, but to be truth to be told beryllium tweeters can sound really fantastic and i have friends who have beryllium tweeter speakers and they love them to death so <laughs> please do not burn your speakers if they happen to have beryllium drivers they can be absolutely fantastic speakers and they do have an absolutely astounding high extension up to maybe up, up to like 50 kilohertz they are just have that kind of strength up to 30 kilohertz that another comparable modern tweeter has up to 17 or 18 kilohertz so that's that's just an insane addition like over half an octave addition to that but if you want to look at at the distortion how much they color the sound it's uh, the compression drivers win hands down so if you want a natural sound then then compression drivers are perfect for you if if your uh, main criteria is mid-range through uh, mid-high frequencies if you want that that uh, 17 kilohertz plus region that just adds the, some bare ambience to to the sound which is beyond anyone's hearing acuity then the uh, beryllium tweeters uh, are uh, are better in that however that is like icing on the cake so a Berlin Teeter, it, it's a cake that in contrast is, is a very shoddy, poor cake, but has the finest icing in the world. And the compression driver, the 288, is like the best cake in the world you can ever imagine, but they just pff, have the most basic icing on it. So that's why it's not going to win your prizes at the shows but if you want to not just look at it and then and, and, and just put a tag on it that this is the best cake in the show so to show it on TV it's perfect because on TV there's no taste coming through it's just the visuals, the pictures the same thing with the, with the, with the frequency extension too it's, it's what, the, what the meat of it is you are getting is the 17 kilohertz and lower and for some people, I would say it's, it's for, for some golden ears like me who have hearing acuity up to the mid 17k regions. My hearing goes up to 17.5k, so that's what I can consciously hear and identify. Beyond 17.5, I cannot hear it, it's, it's just subliminal. But for most people, especially male, the subliminal already starts at, at 14 kilohertz, 13, sometimes 10. Uh, sometimes it's just genetic but it is due to age or hearing deteriorates but if you work at it and you consciously improve your hearing it can improve so and you can uh, delay uh, the effects of aging by putting your effort in it so the brain uh, is extremely adaptive and your hearing is extremely adaptive and you can improve it but of course needless to say if you can already hear up to 16 kilohertz it's easier to improve to 17k compared to you can hear only up to 10 kilohertz but winding up back to our topic 
it's uh, the high frequencies up to 15 kilohertz that matter the most uh, but beyond that so 15 kilohertz to uh, 100 kilohertz or I would say like 150 kilohertz because we hear still hear 100 kilohertz plus sounds through our skull so the top of the skull is sensitive to 100 kilohertz sound frequencies and our skull gets resonating it's vibrating at 100k and 120k it, at those frequencies and if it has lower harmonics that fall in the auditory range then those vibrations from the skull got uh, transmitted to, to the to the tympanic system and and then you can consciously hear it so if you have a 120 kilohertz sound wave and you modulate it with uh, with human speech and you broadcast it with a with a piezo ultrasonic uh, tweeter then you can hear it because the uh, the subharmonic content will be audible to you even though it's at 120 kilohertz and that's why uh, the high frequency sound content is important in a material because it gives some extra spatial information and makes it uh, makes it for your brain easier to tell whether how how is it in space and where is it coming is it real not real but so so it's it's good if you have that ultrasonic component down so you need that to have to add the last bit of realism but what is happening today is that people are trying to add that last bit of realism without any serious concern for that range that you can actually hear so a lot of our top high-end systems are focusing in that last bit and they neglect the high frequencies that we can hear and then that's what happening with the dome tweeters that they and like beryllium titer they can be extremely good with these upper regions but but in in the audible region they they are <laughs> poor compared to compression drivers but uh, for most people this is uh, not not much of a comparison because no one ever gets to hear compression drivers it's, it's really really rare that someone starts to play with it and and the reason for that what's the catch we are going to look at the catch now so why people don't go into it i would say before we go to the real catch the number two catch is size so to uh, to have like a nice uh, sound out of a compression driver we are using horns horns have been used and horns are big and uh, and the whole history of audio started out because we wanted to shrink things down we have those gigantic cabinets which require a movie theater an entire room behind the screen to house these gigantic gargantuan speakers and 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 the history of audio is going from that to creating bookshelf size speakers and and, and in between sizes that can actually fit in your room and uh, and and the thing what what people are realizing today is that we have done a terrific job of shrinking down audio gear and then those shrunken down uh, boxes sound better and better almost year by year but what even audiophiles do not realize is that their sound is how poor they sound is still compared to those really big systems and 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 when you think about the really big voice of the theater speakers you must not compare the best of our modern technology to an unmodified 50s system dude we have to bring those guys that use that technology with with the uh, with the components with parts with with capacitors chokes and mm -hmm. so on which are available at our current technology and and adapt them and rebuild them to uh, present day specifications and and possibilities to bring out the best from them and when we do that that's when we realize 
that we have succeeded in creating a tiny box but there is no way on planet earth that we can shrink a 10 meter long 30 hertz sound wave to <laughs> a 10 centimeter 30 hertz sound wave so there's uh, limitations of physics and uh, and and these tiny miniature thinrised uh, sound systems do a phenomenal job in uh, finding out things how to get around that but they are really still far away from an uncompromised solution so before we start looking at the scratch the catch i play for you again that medieval music that we listened at the first time but the recorder hasn't started so hopefully now it started and let's it's coming from cd <laughs> So when they, this group, uh, the Troubadour group from Sweden, they visited, I think, uh, about 10 years ago and they had a concert at Iolani High School. Sai invited me to that concert. He's a fellow audiophile of mine. He's on the island. He, he's a fantastic guy with a fantastic stereo system. He's a huge Beatles fan and, uh, and he organizes few of those concerts were organized back then and, and took care of uh, certain things anyway that's just a, a tangent to everything happening here so without further ado let's look at that so the catch with compression drivers is the horn here we see that's a DIY version of a 1505B horn that was the horn that was developed for the Altec Voice of the Theater 8 Five system and and let's read what it says so that has a 112 db per watt per meter sensitivity in the 1 to 5 kilohertz brand, band however response drops to 103 db at 16 17 kilohertz so so that's the catch uh, we, we still get tremendously high efficiency out of the compression driver but only between 1 and 5 kilohertz so so we get it like really high and then it just drops down 9 db so this is like 1 5 16 like 16 and, and up so that's 9 db drop so it means that, that that tremendous efficiency that tremendous potential and power that's in the compression driver it's really throttled back it's choked back quite a lot 9 db that's a lot and you think oh then we are toast so let's go for that beryllium tweeter but no no you are still not right because even with minus 9 db down we are still 11 db up with resolution and sensitivity above that uh, above normal tweeters so we are still a league out of uh, out of everyone's uh, performance for the 1 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz or at least 17 kilohertz range so if you want this range reproduce the best then horns are the way for you but you have to eq them and that's uh, that's that's a huge Achilles here and and that's one reason why you have to modernize the crossover if you want to listen to a voice of the theater speakers because there is a, a tremendous advancement that has been made in the past 70 years for resistor capacitor and inductor technology it totally changed and revolutionized so so you need to upgrade a lot of things but still there is uh, the limitation uh, that the horn places on your system and, and people go literally they go nuts and they spend the whole lifetime finding the perfect horn because uh, let's, let's start from ground zero the job of the horn is basically to transform the tuning frequency of your compression driver to a much lower tuning frequency this i think it, it first it won't make any kind of sense to a lot of people even those who have been playing around with horns for a lot but let's just look into this and then let me explain you what this means 
so so when you have this is the same horn the 1505b but that's the original one the made, made out of metal it's a metal horn it weighs a ton you drop it on your foot that's <laughs> bye bye foot uh, so what these horns do is they they work best in the one through three kilohertz range and and you can play around with any kind of big horns that go down to 500 hertz or so or lower then then you will find that they are strongest always between the one to three k kilohertz and and then below that they drop if you make them bigger then you can prevent the drop from happening and and if you uh, if you uh, go higher in frequency they start to drop again and they drop down to 16 kilohertz and then they they keep at the minus 9 minus 10 minus 8 something like that level until until it fizzles out and um, so so that's because this is the working range it, it's 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 kind of like a port that's tuned to 1.5 kilohertz and it's open one octave above one octave below so it's going uh, basically one, one to three kilohertz plus you can extend more out of it if you uh, play around with the geometry of the horn and uh, and and thus for uh, if, if you use it for example with the 288 driver this horn then you can get from 500 hertz to 17.2 kilohertz 17.5 kilohertz output or maybe a little higher maybe you can go up to even to 20 kilohertz if you EQ it lower uh, but you have to put like a minus 9 dB damper between 1 to 5k or so and I just put some numbers up there but it's, it's really you have to adapt it to the drive uh, to, to the exact curve so there's I cannot just tell you numbers just from my head because it depends on the diaphragm and then all sorts of stuff but this is the magnitude that, that you have to work around with however this is the question that I never ever seen anyone ask not even people who have been playing around with horns for maybe 40 years or more is what is responsible for this drop and, and people just automatically assume that your compression driver is to blame so your driver cannot keep up at those high frequencies so what shall we do let's add another compression driver to uh, to work at that six plus kilohertz region and that's what most of those people who, who play around with the uh, Altec cabinets do is that they add the JBL uh, compression driver for the top end to fill out those frequencies and this is a valid solution there's nothing wrong with it but what I have realized what I have learned and what I want to share with you that for this drop it's not the fault of the compression driver uh, the compression driver the 288 is strong as strong as AF going up all the way and and uh, I did a little bit of an experiment so to that I was uh, playing two of these drivers uh, a 902 and, and a 288 side by side I had them bare no horn attached I just added a signal generator to them actually I used my iPhone's output I had a signal generator app in it and just from the headphone out I hooked up <laughs> the drivers and just just uh, fed them the sine wave and and just checked it like how how high can it go and how low can it go and and the results were totally astonishing and amazing and one one of the thing was that uh, uh, I tried the 902 first this is here the the grain space audio model uh, the one I have it's not the GPA it's, it's one of the old uh, attack ones it's you know the, the green cover one and uh, 
when I went higher in frequency I could hear it up to 17.5 kHz. The 288 I could hear it only up to 17.2. So yes, I confirm to everyone out there that uh, by hearing the 902 does go higher than the 288. And, uh, and I think this is maybe probably an important confirmation because we, we, we tend to rely on our equipment. So we measure it that it what's the extension, but, but if you cannot hear it, how do you know how that measurement correlates to real world experience? You, you need to have some sort of verification, some sort of real feedback what's going on. Because this is like us being surgeons. So if you are working with the uh, audio, it's like being a surgeon who is working on a patient. And, and if the surgeon, he, he just goes to the point that you get your best tools, you learn the knowledge, you, you have your, all your syringes in order, you have all your chemicals labeled in the cabinet, that doesn't mean anything unless you operate on your patient. And when you operate on your patient, you need feedback from your patient. So those designers, those engineers who rely on their measurements and they don't listen, it's the, the same as a surgeon who operates the patient and doesn't follow up what happened to the patient. Did the patient actually get better? Did the patient survive or maybe the patient passed away five minutes after the operation? He's not interested in it. So that's why guys, if you are an engineer, listen to that DARM product you are developing. If you are not listening to it, you are insulting your customers. Please don't do that. Don't be like the surgeon who once he does the last stitch, kicks out the patient and doesn't even ask. Because if you are like that, you will never learn from your mistakes and you will never know that the technique you used was it better for the patient or was it worse. Just do some feedback and work on your stuff. So that's... <laughs> so how do I relate this to my experience listening to these two drivers? Is that on paper the 902 high frequency extension is much better than the 288 and I can confirm that by hearing that yes, this goes a little higher than that. But the other thing that it's not written on any paper was that when I was listening to them, the sound coming from the 288 was astonishing. Just listening to that sine wave was, wow, this is like beautiful music. And, and coming from the 902, those test tones was like some windy, metallic, broken S, S, H, I, T. So the tonality of the 288 is, is massively light years ahead of 902. And this is what people don't grasp when they are playing around with their uh, things is that they just want to go for, you know, numbers and what, what is expected. But, but you, when you do something, you really just have to put yourself there and listen to your ears and work on yourself. How do you want to develop a million dollar audio system when you are not a million dollar audiophile? You need to have here the hearing developed first to do the first thing with audio, then you can go. It's like a musician. If you cannot hear tone, you cannot know what's like, what's like a, an A440, don't touch that violin. You're going to hurt it and you're going to hurt your audience, please. Musicians know it. Us audiophiles, we are like the little brothers and sisters of musicians. Please learn from them. So anyway, <laughs> the 288 tonality is light years ahead of the 902 and the high frequencies, like that 17 kHz that's coming up, it's a much more pure 
strong, cleaner, coherent 17K that the 902 can put out. So this is what I meant by when you have your cake and your icing. Yeah, 902 has a little bit more icing on the cake, but the cake is a second-rate cake. The Altec 288 has little icing, but it has the best cake you can ever taste. And no wonder, because when you compare the two, the 902 is 6 pounds, so it's like almost 3 kilos weight, and the 288 is 30 pounds, 5 times more massive, heavier, bigger. And when you look at the sensitivity, the uh, 902 has 106 dB, and this 288 has, is above 113 dB efficiency. So, so you have there like a 7 plus dB efficiency differential between the two. And, and here we have uh, them rotated at different angles, but let me just get green color. Both of them have, so this part, this is where, this is actually a plastic housing that when you remove these screws, the diaphragm is behind that, it's sitting there. So after you took it off, you can unscrew the diaphragm and, and change it for another one. So here, uh, the, the 288, it's, it's facing as the other way around and that plastic housing is down there. And on top of that, that's where well, as it fires up, that's where the magnetic structure and, 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 and the main body of the compression driver is. And this is basically the height. So here you see that. That's, that's the height of, your, of the motor system and then the central shaft from where the sound projects forward. That's where, that's where it's coming from. And here, for the case of the 280, it's like... Uh, almost like 10 centimeters high and the same structure magnetic structure for the 902 is about an inch high like like three four times shallower than the 288 so it's it's like a puny motor really and a puny structure compared to the 288 so let's go so this is how these two are looked upon in the in the audio community in the horn enthusiast so, so the 902 uh, and, and, and the 288 both and generally I can add every other compression driver here the 3 kHz to 10 kHz region all of them are fabulous there's, there's no, no, no contest there, no issues there and then generally any compression driver you choose 3K to 10K you get it covered what is the really big issue with horns is the 500 to 3 kilohertz region and uh, and the 1000k plus region that's where all the different all the opinions differ and the experience is very greatly and when you look at the 902 then it's champ for the 10k plus region it, it extends out really high Pe people like that but when you look at uh, at the if you go around 500 hertz then it's 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 still strong compared to dome tweeters or ribbons or anything it's going to bench you know 10 times better than anything in comparison but compared to the 288 it's it cannot stand it he the 288 is the king of mid-range so if you are playing around with uh, compression drivers, the uh, so if you want to cover the 500 hertz to a kilohertz region or a little higher than that, or 500 to 5k, or if you have a gigantic horn, you can go as low as 300 hertz. It can handle it. Then uh, then it's your top choice, and then people above that then they add something else to. Uh, supplement the the higher frequencies and uh, so or if you just want to use it up to 10k and then people add like a JBL compression driver for 10k plus but do you need to do that and is this preconception that assumption that people have 
is this because of the inherent capa capabilities of the drivers or is it something else? Let's look at it. <laughs> 